toughest short track race at Thunder Road International Speed Bowl in the granite capital of the world, Barry, Vermont. It's the 33rd annual Vermont Chevy Dealers Milk Bowl. Hello, everyone. Ken Squire, and welcome to Vermont's biggest stock car race. 24 drivers have qualified for today's event, and it's our pleasure to bring you all three 50-lap segments of this exciting stock car classic. Now, this race is run a little different than most. You qualify for the pole, you run 50 laps, and if you're out in front, they stick you on the rear to run 50 more laps as they invert the field. And then they invert them a third time. So you've got to run and win, race hard all day in three segments if you are to be ultimately the Milk Bowl champion. Now, working with me today is a guy who won this race back in 1976, Ron Barkham. Ron, what about it? You've been down here looking at this field of cars, over 42 cars here to qualify for those 24 spots. What's impressed you? Well, the quality of the cars, Ken, is a tremendous uh, factor in this thing. And they've got some beautiful machineries here that are well kept. For this late in the season, to see them uh, this well prepared for this race, uh, you know they came here to run and run hard. And they've got to do that all day long, as you said earlier. To uh, eventually be a Milk Bowl winner, you've got to be consistent. Consistency is the key, isn't it, Ron? It certainly is. The first uh, two segments are like setup segments, and you're you're trying to get yourself in a good position for that last segment to uh, to run for the for the lead, and that's where you got to be because that's the overall winner just determined in that last segment. So we're down to it. The 33rd annual Vermont Chevy Dealers Milk Bowl covering the pit area. And the action there today will be a veteran of Thunder Road and a great racing family in Vermont. Let's go to Big Bigelow. Thank you, Ken. It's just like the old country song. It's a family tradition. Chuck Beatty, the winner of the 1996 poll, joins his brother who won the poll in 1991 and 92, joining the uh, Dragon Brothers from Milton, Vermont, Bobby in 1969 and Beaver in 1990 as the only two brother combinations to sit on the poll for the prestigious Milk Bowl. How does that make you feel, Chuck? I feel great. You know, there's a lot of tradition here and a lot of history behind this race, and it's hard to get in, so sit on the pole to me is something special, and I'm looking forward for a good day, and hopefully I'll come out with a win. And if he does win, it'll be joining the Ingerson brothers, who won in 1963 and 65. So it'll be the Ingersons, the Dragons, and then the Beaties. Back to you, Ken. Starting lineup for the 33rd annual Milk Bowl will have Chuck Beatty, former Thunder Road champion, number 54, on the pole. Beside him will be the number 83 from St. Johnsbury, Stacy Cahoon, as they follow the number 46 car that was the track championship car in the first year of Thunder Road. Then starting third will be Dave Whitcomb. Starting in fourth is a great racing family in Vermont, Brent Dragon. In fifth will be Pat Corbett. Starting sixth today, Rupert Flipper Irwin of Waterbury, Vermont. In seventh from the central Vermont area, Phil Scott, who is the track champion for 1996. Kip Stockwell out of the Randolph area. We'll start in eighth position, number 16. Starting ninth will be John Paul Sear out of Milton, Vermont. Father Norm Sear was a fine racer a couple of decades back. Barney McRae, longtime well-known name in Vermont racing off the uh, NASCAR North Tour, will start in 10th position, number 99. Eric Williams, brilliant driver from Hyde Park, Vermont car that his brother is the chief mechanic on. Number 71 will start in 11th to go 12th will be Mike Bruno in number 22. He from down in Addison County. Then in 13th will be Brian Hoare with the Dodge Avenger number 45. In the 14th position is Mark Lamberton in the number 29 out of New York State. And then from Williamstown, Vermont in 15th position, number 31 Lance Perno. Going in the 16th position is Richard Bootsy of Barry, Vermont. And 17th is the 04 of Greg Lyman. 18th is the number two, Norm Andrews, former Thunder Road champion from Warren, Vermont. In the 19th position is Billy Holbrook. Holbrook will start in 19th, and Pete Fecto, number 75, will start 20th. Going 21st on the field is Berger Blake as the field rolls up towards a start. Beside him is the number nine. Then just behind them comes Joey LeCare. And rounding out the field is Brett Wheeler. The car number nine, Ricky Roberts, a two-time winner this year out of Graniteville, Vermont, in his black and gold car. Starts in that 22nd position. 24 cars start. They'll run 50 laps. Low point counts in three 50 lap races. If you win the first race, you get one point. 
and then you go to the rear of the field and start again. And if you get a perfect score, it's three and you win it all. Pace car has him in tow, Ron. Got any predictions? Oh, I just think that we're going to find a very competitive race, Ken. And uh, you're probably definitely going to see a first-time winner of a football other than Chuck Beatty and uh, Barney McRae, the other 22 starters are non football veterans, so it has to be a Barney or a Chuck at Victory Lane, our first-time winner. <laughs> All right. Chuck Beatty, whose brother was a two-time winner, settles down on the pole. Stacy Cahoon in the Husqvarna, number 83, rides alongside. And the first 50 laps is about to be unfolded. Nice start. Then Wheeler dives to the inside, and Wheeler goes immediately to hold on the third spot. At the end of lap one. as they're working lap number three. The zero car, Brent Dragon, got loose. And he collects Stacy Cahoon. So, those cars that had qualified, Dragon in fourth, Cahoon in second, will find themselves back in 23rd and 24th. Gary, just between you and me, you find Earnhardt, you know, intimidating? Well, he's pretty darn competitive. Nobody trades paint like Dale. He does have that black Monte Carlo. Yeah, he's got that black Monte Carlo. But remember one thing. When he first started, his car was pink. No, pink? Pink? Pink. And he's never gotten over it. Genuine Chevrolet. The cars more champions trust. No matter what color the paint. Okay, we're with the car number zero, Brent Dragon, the first casualty of the day. It appears that he has a right side tie rod and it broke. And I have to say that his chance of winning the Vermont Chevy Milk Bill will be done for the day. As we said earlier in the show, his dad won this race way back when. So he's probably out of the day for the first casualty of the day. Ready on the first restart, the milk bowl. And jumping out in front goes number 54. It's Beatty right in front, and here comes Whitcomb after him. Whitcomb on the outside, holds on, and he's going for first. They're even across as they come around to complete lap number three. They went back one lap, and they're still even across the front. Whitcomb trying to pitch Beatty down a little. Beatty will have no part of it. Meanwhile, number five, Pat Corbett, who started in fifth, rolls up into third. Into fourth comes Phil Scott. Side by side for the lead. They hit them on the outside. Chuck Beatty on the inside. They stare each other down around this high bank quarter mile track. Pat Corbett pulling up. Corbett on the move in the number five, just behind these two leaders. Going up into fifth. On the outside, John Paul Sear. He's moved up from ninth, making a very good run. Here's Whitcomb trying to advance off the second turn. Rides it up on the outside, and those two run wheel to wheel. Now Phil Scott closes in. Four-car battle up in front. Phil Scott of number 14 is trying to go around. Pat Corbett, all of this for the lead. This is in lap seven. That's Scott on the outside, challenging number five, Corbett. Phil Scott looks like he's hitched up today, Ron. He certainly does, Ken. He's moved up well. The car seems to be handling extremely well on the outside. And that's very important in this race. Once they start getting into the loft here, we'll see if the car keeps responding as well as it is right now. As well with Brian Hoare, who also seems to be doing real well on that outside move after starting 13th after a DX2 yesterday. And out in this, the lead comes Dave Victim in the 25. Advanced carefully. Took 10 laps of rim riding, but he pulls himself into the lead. It's Whitcomb in first in this first 50-lap segment. Coming around to complete 11 laps in the 
second spot is beating and closing is Bill Scott. Scott inching his way along in a three-car battle for the lead. Colbert has fallen back about four car lengths and into the grip of number 32, John Paul Sear of Milton, Vermont. The three are battling for the lead. Sear in the 32 comes after the number five. John Paul Sear takes the high side through the Widowmaker turn. It's Sear on the high side, trying to get himself around on Pat Corbett. The five and the 32 battling down the back straightaway. And Kip Stockwell is on the move. He's going for six around Flipper Irwin. John Paul Sear goes to fourth. Pat Corbett falls to fifth. Stockwell pulls up into the sixth position. Flipper Irwin is in seventh. And going eighth is the number 71, Eric Williams out of High Park, Vermont. Now the 54 tries the inside on the 25 for the lead. Here's Beatty all over the back bumper, beating away on Dave Whitcomb. And out to the outside goes Scott. This is for the lead in West Got a cross on the front straightaway, Ted. Got a heavy pileup. It is number four in trouble with the number two and the 04. Lyman is there. He collects Norm Andrews. And the four car that had started toward the rear end of this field is also collected in that group. Well, it started it all off, Ken. Seemed to be the 31 car, Lance Verno, getting sideways. Whether he had help to get that way or not, I didn't get to see that. But I know he was sideways at the track walk. And the two car just had trouble finding room. It didn't seem to really slow down much before he got there. The Texaco Haviland car with Norm Andrews aboard. Greg Lyman's car getting caught up in that. So there's a flag down, second one of the race, and it shows 16 laps now complete. Gary, just between you and me, I find Earnhardt, you know, intimidating. Well, he's pretty darn competitive. Nobody trades paint like Dale. He does have that black Monte Carlo. Yeah, he's got that black Monte Carlo. But remember one thing. When he first started, his car was pink. No, pink? Pink? Pink. And he's never gotten over it. Genuine Chevrolet. The car's more champions trust. No matter what color the paint is. You. We're with Lance Ferno, another casualty of the front stretch melee there. What seems to happen, Lance? Uh, I was on the outside, and uh, Billy Holbrook got up, got into me, and got me around. I stopped, and uh, Norm come along and creamed the front of the car. Now, it looks to me that the car is obviously done for the day. You think you might be able to get out for segment number two? Yeah, we're going to try. See how it goes from there. <laughs> okay. That was Lance Ferno. It appears that he may be getting out for second number two, segment number two, but like I said earlier, I believe he's done for the day. So we're back underway. Incidentally, Stacy Cahoon back on the track and running, back behind Pete Vecto, tail end of the field. Nice start. Very even across. To the outside, goes Beatty in the 54. Whitcomb comes right back on. What a war this is between these two. Then you see on the inside, the black and gold. Green livery of Bill Scott, and Scott has a hole. Bill Scott dives down to the inside. He has Beatty pinned on the outside, and Scott is going for second place. Back in the main straightaway. Bill Scott in the second. They put them out in front. John Paul Sear picks it up again. Sear is running the outside in the red, yellow, number 32. He's coming up to fifth. For the lead on the outside, Scott rim riding where he has been the last half of the season. Right up on the high side, Ron, where you used to run. You and Tiller used to hang it right out there out of the Widowmaker. Well, that's where you have to run out here, Ted, if you want to make any progress. Uh, everybody can run the low inside groove. If you want to pass, you've got to go by them on the outside, so that's where they got to run it. Meanwhile, number 45, the Dodge Avenger, Moore down on the inside, fighting with John Paul Sear. What a fight that is. Pat Corbett is in fourth, but here comes John Paul Sear on the outside, trying to take it away from him. He's in fifth, and in sixth, you see the number 45 of Brian Hoare. That's all that fourth position battle. And also in there is Mike Bruno. What a job he's doing. Scott lies second in the lead as Whitcomb. John Paul Sear comes up to the outside. Going 
going for it. Corbett down low. John Paul Sear, 30 years old, out of Milton, Vermont, rim riding his way around. About 80, 85 miles an hour in the main straightaway, and then you slide it a little on these high banks, and he's around Corbett in a beautiful race. Look at Brian Hoare, inches away from the back of the number five. Rolling him south into four, goes number 32, and the 14 spins out. Scott goes all the way around and keeps going. Keeps on it and comes right back in. Scott battling for the lead. Boston picks it up, he goes all the way to the tail end. Now he's gotta fight his way all the way back through traffic. That's lap 26. Phil Scott in second place, challenging for the lead. Loops it out of turn number two, gathers it up, keeps on trucking. Working lap number 28. It's Whitcomb out in front, Beatty is in second. And now it's John Paul Sear in the third. Boy, Sear is on a roll. Bill Scott's off the back, spent to the number 14, can to bring out the yellow. This will uh, double everything back up again. So it's gonna double them back up. It comes out at lap number 28. And Scott is down to the back straightaway. Something broke on car number 14. There you see it. Phil Scott, 1996 road champion. The car smoldering over there. Yeah, he, he might have some engine problems, but he seemed to drive off that way like something broke, Ken. So oh, that would be a see. heartbreaker, huh? Phil Scott challenging for the lead, and it went away on him. Wrecker crew is immediately there for Phil Scott. Showing at the present time, Dave Whitcomb for first. Chuck Beatty in second, and John Paul Sear has brought himself up in the third spot. Gary, just between you and me, you find Earnhardt, you know, intimidating? Well, he's pretty darn competitive. Nobody trades paint like Dale. He does have that black Monte Carlo. Yeah, he's got that black Monte Carlo. But remember one thing, when he first started, his car was pink. No, pink? Pink? Pink, and he's never gotten over it. Genuine Chevrolet, the cars more champions trust, no matter what color the paint. Pink. Well, with Phil Scott, the apparent winner of the uh, Thunder Road Point Championship this year, but his hopes for Milk Bowl seems to have been dashed with 28 laps to go in the first segment. Phil, do you know what happened out there? No, I really don't. Something uh, just went loose in the motor or something. I'm really not sure, but kind of disappointing because we, we had a good car and I thought we were going to be there, but it started to heat up and uh, I could feel it started to labor a little bit more and it was finally something let loose. Okay, that's Phil Scott. Like I say, we do believe he was the point winner of this year's championship for the Thunder Road Championship. Phil Scott, done for the day. Back to you, Ken. Ready on the restart. And as they jockey out of turn number four, Whitcomb brings them down. Green is out. Got a nice jump. Ooh. They push Beattie out of the way. Sear muscling his way. Put the shoulder to Beattie, and Beattie falls back. Pat Corbett gets up underneath him for third position. Echo, the leader is Dave Whitcomb. Ronnie McRae just in front. Could go a lap down here the 99. Your leader is the 25. Whitcomb out in front. John Paul's here in second spot. Pat Corbett's in third. And down the inside. A correction, Beattie is in third. And down the inside comes Corbett in fourth. And the hookup across is between the 22. 45. Four in the 45 takes the dot of entry down and closes in on Corbett in the number five. And they work each other over. Bruno on the outside, the 22 has the running room and he begins to move out. The 22 rolling on the outside. He seems to be working real well out there, Ken. Uh, Corbett's always a good steady line on the inside and giving him plenty of room to run that race car find his way around the five and might even challenge the 54 of Chuck Beatty. Matt Corbett in the number five challenged. It's Mike Bruno in the number 22 rolling up on the outside. And trying to move through. Another great story, Ken, the 27 of Burger Blake, the B feature winner. 
is now raced into the top 10 and will be challenging the 45 of Brian Hoare on the outside along with the 22 of Mark Bruno. One good ride here from Berger Blake in that 27 all the way from the back. Meanwhile, in front, Dave Whitcomb continues to lead by four car lengths. John Paul Sear in the red and yellow number 32 stays in second. Gary, just between you and me, I find Earnhardt, you know, intimidating. Well, he's pretty darn competitive. Nobody trades paint like Dale. He does have that black Monte Carlo. Yeah, he's got that black Monte Carlo. But remember one thing. When he first started, his car was pink. No, pink? Pink, pink, and he's never gotten over it. Genuine Chevrolet, the car's more champions trust, no matter what color. Sear in second, Beatty in third. Looks like Sear into and, and Pat Corbett into fourth as they came across the line. Give you the official scoring on it in just a moment as number 25, Dave Whitcomb, scores one point for the win. Corbett comes across in the fourth position, followed in fifth by the 45 as they struck the line. That was Brian Hoare in the Avenger. Then in six was the number 22, Mike Bruno. And Billy Holbrook was in seventh with Eric Williams in eighth. Good run in that first event. And two more to come to decide the 1996 Chevy Dealers Milk Bowl. Thank you, Ken. We're with the winner of the first segment, Dave Whitcomb, the 1995 King of the Road. You started third in that segment. Uh, Dave and get yourself to first. Now the hard part. You're going to start 24th. How do you feel the second segment may go? Well, we were a little loose this time here, you know, but I got a great crew and we're going to go back and work on the car and hopefully we'll get it so it'll go a little bit better and we can come up through, I'm hoping. Okay, now you were second in the point standings going into this and as you know, Phil Scott's having motor trouble. Uh, are you going to change your strategy at all? You're just going to go out there and try to win the milk ball? Oh, we got to win the milk ball. If there's any way that we were going to win a championship here, we'd have to win today and then it's going to be close. Between you and me, I find Earnhardt, you know, intimidating. Well, he's pretty darn competitive. Nobody trades paint like Dale. He does have that black Monte Carlo. Yeah, he's got that black Monte Carlo. But remember one thing. When he first started, his car was pink. No, pink? Pink? Pink. And he's never gotten over it. Genuine Chevrolet. The car's more champions trust, no matter what color. At the end of the first segment of the milk pool, Dave Whitcomb was first for one point. Low point wins the overall out of three 50-lap races, so Whitcomb now goes to the rear. John Paul Sear was second, Chuck Beatty third, Pat Corbett fourth for four points, Brian Hoare fifth, then Mike Bruno in sixth, Billy Holbrook seventh, Greg Blake was eighth, Eric Williams was ninth, and Pete Pecto was tenth. Ricky Roberts was 11th, Rupert Irwin was 12th for 12 points, 13th was Mark Lamberton, and then 14th was Joey LeCare with 15th, Stacy Cahoon, and 16th, Kip Stockwell. The second 50 laps rolling. They come to the line with Greg Lyman leading them down. And on the outside is the number zero. And that number zero 
is uh, scored as Dragon as he works his way along the outside. Inverting the field, so coming from the rear are the heavy hitters, Whitcomb and John Paul Sear. Leading in the early going of this segment, as you see, jumping out in front is Greg Lyman. Into second goes Brent Dragon. And Barney McRae up on the outside for third. McRae gets a little wide. Barr gets a little loose on him, and Richard Bootsy guns it down on the inside to go into third overall. Meanwhile, from the back of the field, here comes Whitcomb on a roll run. Yeah, we're finding out that uh, the 45 and the 22, again, are running the outside like they did much of that very first segment, Ken. And uh, they have to get out to the front. These guys run from the back all week long in shorter distance races. But the competition here today is extremely tight. And the one that can make that break first and make it stick is going to be a, to a big advantage, especially in this uh, plate setting stage here. The second segment's always been very referred to as a plate setter because you want to set your up to yourself to run good in that uh, last segment because the last segment, the first finishing car usually gets the points there. Whitcomb back there in 18th, now 19th position as Brian Horst scoots around. Coming back to the line, and Whitcomb is in heavy traffic, trying to get sorted out to move through this field. They've completed seven laps with Greg Lyman in the 04 out in front. Brett Dragon is in second in the zero. Then riding third on the field is the 21 Richard Bootsy, and in fourth is Kip Stockwell, 16. In fifth is Joey LeCare, and in sixth going to the inside is Flipper Irwin. Gary, just between you and me, do you find Earnhardt, you know, intimidating? Well, he's pretty darn competitive. Nobody trades paint like Dale. He does have that black Monte Carlo. Yeah, he's got that black Monte Carlo. But remember one thing. When he first started, his car was pink. No, pink? Pink? Pink and he's never gotten over it. Genuine Chevrolet, the cars more champions trust, no matter what color they're painted. Pink. For the lead in the second 50-lap segment, Brent Dragon goes down the inside and challenges Lyman in the 04. Coming up with it, Richard Bootsy. This is happening in lap 14. Meanwhile, those heavy leaders further back in the field, Bruno in the 22, Whitcomb in the 25, trying to get themselves sorted out. And they've got to be very cautious here, not to step on somebody's toes and find themselves going into the wall. Up in front, Greg Lyman in that second spot. Falling back another is Richard Bootsy. Scoots on the bottom out of turn number two. And in lap number 16, he takes over in third as Kip Stockwell drives the number 16 low to the Widowmaker. And he's going to pin Lyman on the outside and take over in third in this second 50-lap segment. Further back in the field is where the story will be told. Stacy Cahoon begins his drive. He's up into ninth now. And breaking away comes Whitcomb and Beatty. They're moving. Yes, they are, Ken, and they've, you know, they've going to make a pace here now. We're into the 17th lap of this second segment. They're still out of the top 10, but they seem to be running towards the front. 54 is in 13th. That's Beatty up to 13th from tail ending. And with him comes the 25. Tracy Belrose, starting this segment, became the first woman to ever enter the Milk Bowl from Berlin, New Hampshire. Miss Tracy Belrose was the first alternate and with the Bill Scott car blowing an engine in the first segment, that moved Tracy Bellrose into the milk bowl. Beatty in the 54, right up behind Billy Holbert, and really giving the 54 a good ride. A respectful ride. And with him comes Eric Williams. Williams in the 71, working on the outside with John Paul Sear. And I'm Amazed at how well they're using the brake as well as the throttle and respecting each other out here, Ron. This they, is tough going on a quarter mile. They certainly are, Ken. This is, uh, you've got to give this, these drivers a whole lot of credit. They, they haven't yet showed any impatience, and maybe they're saving it all up for once, but right now they're, uh, they're driving a very professional race in both of the 
segments so far. They're giving each other room on the outside and they're not chopping. Uh, they're doing a hell of a job and they're running real good on this outside though, as uh, Chuck Beatty and Dave Whitcomb are, are able to move around again. And they, they said that they were going to run the outside this segment, talking to them before this segment started. They said they're going to the outside until they get to the front. Well, we'll see if it holds true. A lap away from halfway in the second segment, 25 down, all under green as Brent Dragon leads with Bootsy in second. Here they come out of four, those two leaders, followed by Stockwell in third. And this is gonna shake those points up. They are running so well, driving so strongly out here. Nobody putting a wheel wrong thus far through the first half of this race. Gary, just between you and me, you find Earnhardt, you know, intimidating? Well, he's pretty darn competitive. Nobody trades paint like Dale. He does have that black Monte Carlo. Yeah, he's got that black Monte Carlo. But remember one thing. When he first started, his car was pink. No, pink? Pink? Pink. And he's never gotten over it. Genuine Chevrolet, the car's more champions trust, no matter what color they're painted. Pink. Well, the battle for the lead is gorgeous. Look at this. Bootsy down on the inside. Here's Dragon up on that middle groove for the lead. Hell of a race out of the front, Ken. You got Richard Bootsy in the 21 car, dozed under uh, Brett Dragon in the zero, and they're running real tight out of the turn four. Uh, Richard seems to be holding on. He's got a good groove down there low. He seems to be working good there. He's kept the car there all day long, and that seems to be where that car really wants to run the best. Yet. The way it's running right now at the end of the second segment, it could be a three-way tie. Look at Stockwell come up into this in the number 16. The Tiger, his dad, never won this race. Lenny Tiger Stockwell, but Kip Stockwell putting on a tremendous performance. Here he is challenging Dragon now, and it looks like the handle may have gone away a bit on the zero. He's given up some ground on the inside. Stockwell takes over in second, and rolling up into third comes Joey LeCare. 32 laps down. Now they've run 32 green flag laps, Ken, so them tires are half heated up, and the cars that haven't got the chassis quite right are starting to show it in uh, the way they're going around the track, and uh, Brett Dragon definitely uh, wasn't set up to run this long on, uh, without a yellow flag to cool them tires down, because he's got real loose. And it looks like Dave Wickham's car is loosened up as well. So we're going to see now what happens. Yeah, Lance Furno in the 31 is right down the inside of Dave Wickham, and he's going to take a spot away from him. That's going to drop Wickham back to 12. And Chuck Beatty is pulling up on Billy Holbrook in the 72. That put him in the top 10 if he could get around Holbrook. John Paul Sear again is working the outside. Take a look at this. There you see the 72. Billy Holbrook has driven a fine race. Holbrook stays right with it out here. But Beatty is closing him down. This for 10th. Meanwhile, in front, Bootsy, number 21. He'll be thrilled to win a segment of the Milk Bowl. His dad. His family worked on the old Larry Granger car years ago, number 93, in the days of the Yankee Flyer, Mike Osborne, Tony Coluccio, that gang that ran the road when it first opened. Gary, just between you and me, you find Earnhardt, you know, intimidating? Well, he's pretty darn competitive. Nobody trades paint like Dale. He does have that black Monte Carlo. Yeah, he's got that black Monte Carlo. But remember one thing, when he first started, his car was pink. No, pink? Pink? Pink, and he's never gotten over it. Genuine Chevrolet, the car's more champions trust, no matter what color they're painted. Pink. Brian Horace taking that spot away from Dave Wickham, moved him one more back, and Brian seems to be running extremely well on the outside, Ken. He's, he's got that car together. He's got his set sights now on Chuck Beatty, and again, this is going to really take a toll on who stands where going into that last segment. Yeah, I'll tell you, and you can see the number 25 is in trouble. In the corners, he's just not getting the handle. He's having to take a couple of sets to get through. Meanwhile, the 45 of Brian Hoare closes up on Beatty. The 45 closes in on Beatty down the main straightaway. Look at Brian Hoare. Bring that Dodge Avenger on. 
I think he's got a couple spots left in him, even though it's only three laps to go. He's going to go to the outside. Here comes the 45, and this could be a big move for him. He takes it up to the outside, the 45. There he is, trying to move around the number 54. He's doing it with relative ease, Ken. I mean, his car is just putting rubber on the pavement right now and making it stick. Last lap. This is it. Down to decide this one. And what a decision this is going to be. It's going to be number 21, Bootsy, coming home for the win. Bootsy will get the win in the second segment with Kip Stockwell in second place. Give you the complete standings in a moment. Gary, just between you and me, you find Earnhardt, you know, intimidating? Well, he's pretty darn competitive. Nobody trades paint like Dale. He does have that black Monte Carlo. Yeah, he's got that black Monte Carlo. But remember one thing. When he first started, his car was pink. No, pink? Pink? Pink. And he's never gotten over it. Genuine Chevrolet, the cars more champions trust, no matter what color they're painted. Where's Richard Bootsy? Uh, the gentleman just put himself in the record books, the annual milk ball. Look a lot better than the first segment out there, Richard. Well, we, you know, we normally run airborne, so we're, we're just getting used to the setup and the tires out here. So it's been a great learning curve. We got there, and the first one, we brushed the wall a little bit, but the second one, that was ours. So I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be in a milk bowl. And I'm glad the car is working as good at this time. Now, it's quite obvious you were a lot better than you were the first segment. Did the crew make a lot of adjustments for you now for that second segment? Uh, we checked everything over, and I don't really know what the car owner did. I know we changed some tires because we hit the wall, and that might have made a better, better setup. Uh, okay, good luck. Really change it too much. Okay, good luck in the third segment. Thank you. That's Richard Bootsy. As we get ready for the third and final segment of the Milk Bowl here at Thunder Road, overlooking the beautiful Green Mountains in Barry, Vermont, it's the most competitive Milk Bowl in history after two segments have been completed. Dave Whitcomb, Ron Barkham, leads by one point. He has 14. He finished first in the first 50 laps and 13th. Give him a total of 14 points. Then there is a two-way tie for second place at 15 points. 10th and 5th, Pete Fecto and Chuck Beatty is tied with him with a third and 12th place finish thus far. So that ties them at 15 each and they're one point behind Whitcomb as we get down to the third and final segment of competition. The fourth place is Greg Blake with that tie for second between Beatty and Fecto. We drop back to fourth and we have three drivers tied just one point behind Fecto and Beatty. Greg Blake, Brian Hoare, Gene Paul Sear each have 16 points. An eighth and an eighth for Greg Blake. Gene Paul Sear had a second and a 14th. Brian Hoare just as consistent, each of them getting 16 points. Then in seventh position, just one point further back, Billy Holbert at 17, tied with Joey LeCare, and Kip Stockwell is at 18. He has a 16th and a second. So, nine drivers, nine drivers have a difference of four points as we go to the final segment of this 33rd annual Milk Bowl. That's as close as it's ever been, Ron. It's uh, certainly a a close, close race, Ken. The competition out on the track has been very clean. They haven't been chopping. They haven't been pushing. Uh, who knows? Everything could break loose in this last segment, but if they continue to run like they have been, uh, I think the guys you're going to want to watch are right in the middle of the pack. Uh, John Paul Sears starting 11th, Dave Wickham starting 12th, and Chuck Beatty 13th, and Brian Hoare 14th. Uh, if you look at those four drivers, I think you're going to see one of them be your milk bowl winner for 1996. Well, it's going to be fun to watch this one. And again, remember that in case of a tie in this final segment, the top finishing position in the third segment becomes the decision maker. That's how they would decide it in the third and final segment. So we're just about ready to send them away for the third and final go here at the 1996 Vermont Chevy Dealers Milk Bowl. And this has been one spectacular event down to nine drivers, four points apart to decide it all. Gary, just between you and me, you find Earnhardt, you know, intimidating? Well, he's pretty darn competitive. Nobody trades paint like Dale. He does have that black Monte Carlo. Yeah, he's got that black Monte Carlo. But remember one thing, when he first started, his car was pink. No, pink? Pink? 
pink, and he's never gotten over it. Genuine Chevrolet, the cars more champions trust, no matter what color they're painted. Third and final segment of the 1996 Milk Bowl coming online. Row number one is the 04 of Greg Lyman and Steve Crash Craddock at number 65 alongside. For row two, it's Pat Corbett and Miss Tracy Bell Rose out of Berlin, New Hampshire in the number 21. In row three, it'll be Mark Lamberton and with him comes Brett Wheeler, number four. In row four, it's Stacy Cahoon from St. Johnsbury, the number 83, and Ricky Roberts. Going to row five in the ninth position is Mike Bruno. He'll be driving the number 22, and with him comes the number 71. That's Eric Williams. For row six, you have Gene Paul Sear in the 32, and Dave Whitcomb in the 25. In row seven will be Chuck Beatty and Brian Hoare, 54 and 45, respectively. Then you come to row eight, and there's Billy Holbrook with Lance Ferno. In row nine, it's Greg Berger Blake out of Barry, Vermont, and Barney McRae. In row 10, Rupert Irwin of Waterbury and Pete Fecto from Lamoille County. Going to row 11, you have Brent Dragon and Barry's Joey LeCare. In row 12, it's Kip Stockwell and Richard Bootsy. And tailgating the field is Simpson. Simpson, and back on the field is the number 14 which would be Scott. Remember, he's missed a segment. He blew an engine, and they've done a complete engine change in number 14 as he's going to give it one more go. Well, Ken, we're going to have to watch those uh, middle rows, the sixth row and the seventh row, uh, with uh, Dave Whitcomb, Chuck Beatty, Brian Hoare, John Paul Sear, all right bunched up. And I would think that maybe one of your winners is going to come out of those four cars. We, we had another retirement. That moved Pat Corbett up onto the front row with Crash Craddock as they scale it down into turn number one, and Craddock is going for the lead. Corbett comes back on the outside. Lap one underway. Coming around, Craddock is going to lead his first lap of Milk Bowl competition. Corbett's right there with him. Tracy, Tracy Bellroad slips back to fifth. The 29, Mike Lamberton up into third. Lamberton beginning to roll. And the guys in the big battle for the points. As we watch Whitcomb trying to get out, remember he has a one-point lead. And he's on a roll, but two positions in front of him is the number 54. Beatty has a chance to beat Whitcomb right here if he can stay there. And Gene Paul Sear, he's on a tear. He's in front of Whitcomb. Wow, this milk bowl is wide open. Craddock stays first. Coming around, working lap five. Corbett stays in second. Lamberton in third. Up on the outside, Bruno in number 22. He's making a run, trying from fifth to go to fourth. But Chuck Beatty kind of Bruno with the 22. Look at him stay out there. Hold that outside. And right behind him, Gene Paul Sear. He gets underslung by Beatty. Beatty made a great move to get under Sear. And he pulls up behind Tracy Cahoon in the 83. This is where the battle is. Tracy Cahoon trying to move on the 29 of Lamberton. Back straight away. There's Lamberton in the black and yellow, number 29. Leader comes by and Craddock stays first. Corbett stays in second. Here's the battle. Lamberton in third and on the outside. Creeping, crawling up comes number 22, Mike Bruno. Cahoon stays with him. This is just a remarkable milk bowl. Here's Gene Paul Sear back again around the 54, around Beatty. Number 32, Sear, putting on a great show. Bruno has the move on Lamberton. And again, he goes upstairs. Tracy Cahoon staying with him. Gary, just between you and me, you find Earnhardt, you know, intimidating? Well, he's pretty darn competitive. Nobody trades paint like Dale. He does have that black Monte Carlo. Yeah, he's got that black Monte Carlo. But remember one thing. When he first started, his car was pink. No, pink? Pink? Pink. And he's never gotten over it. Genuine Chevrolet. The car's more champions trust, no matter what color they're painted. 
Battle continues up in front. As you watch the 65, stay just in front of the five. And now we have a four-car battle for the lead rod. Got four of them out there struggling for first. John Paul Sears, Jean Paul Sears really tried to make a, a run here early, Ken, to get that dominant position. Uh, they've got Dave Wickham on the outside. He's not been able to get around the 29 car of Mark Lamberton. He has to keep uh, Jean Paul Sears in his sights. He cut into to Lamberton a little bit there and then backed off, but he may lose a position out of it. He has to keep the 32 within one car of him, or he is not going to win this goal. Ball. Three car up. battle for the lead tangle here, Ron. Turn four, tangle in turn four, Kenny. We got Stip Cotwell in the 99 of Barney McRae, the 15 of Joy LeClair, and the 75 of Peter Facto. All got turned around up in turn four. Brought out the first caution at lap 19. Bad break for Peter Facto and Joey LeClair, and what a show up in front. But it's a big break for Dave Whitcomb, who had lost probably a couple spots with this going back to the last completed lap. He may get them back in the scoring uh, of this race, Ken. Gary, just between you and me, you find Earnhardt, you know, intimidating? Well, he's pretty darn competitive. Nobody trades paint like Dale. He does have that black Monte Carlo. Yeah, he's got that black Monte Carlo. But remember one thing, when he first started, his car was pink. No, pink? Pink? Pink, and he's never gotten over it. Genuine Chevrolet, the cars more champions trust, no matter what color they're painted. got a five of Pat Corbett either lost uh, a gear there or just can't get started because he just pulled high on the track let the cars oh. go by and shuffled up the lineup a little yeah, bit. Yeah, Corbett had trouble for a moment. Now he's trying to get it back up, get ready to go again, but something wrong on Corbett. Maybe he's, and he looks like he's coming in. Oh, what a heartbreaker for Corbett. Listen. Pat Corbett, who gave such a great display here, comes on to pit road, and I believe Simpson's 51 came in as well. Well, the field's a little loose here. They'll tighten them back up. Oh, what an unfortunate moment for Pat Corbett in the number five. The Mattress Land, Chevrolet Monte Carlo. Now on this re-lineup, they snaggle them up and look at Sear come up on the outside. You think he's got it to deal with Craddock on this start? I'm not sure that this is going to be the correct start, Ken. Uh, your flagman here, Mike Wilder, is waving the yellow. I think they're going to sort them out. Uh, I think the ruling is when a car pulls out of position, that line pulls up. So you may find that uh, what was the fourth place car will now be the second place car on this restart. Gary, just between you and me, you find Earnhardt, you know, intimidating? Well, he's pretty darn competitive. Nobody trades paint like Dale. He does have that black Monte Carlo. Yeah, he's got that black Monte Carlo. But remember one thing, when he first started, his car was pink. No, pink? Pink? Pink, and he's never gotten over it. Genuine Chevrolet, the cars more champions trust, no matter what color they're painted. Pink. Coming around with 19 complete, green is out. We're underway. Look at Sear, trying immediately, getting really aggressive. And something happens to Beatty in the 54. He falls back, four, five, Something is wrong on number 54. Scott coming beneath him now. And he's still not getting going. I think he's broken a transmission. It sure acts that way. The field rolling underneath the pole sitter for the 1996 milk pool. Gene Paul Sear jumps out in front. Big advantage. Could be the biggest win of his career. Craddock is in second. Bruno going to second on the outside. Cahoon stays fourth in the Husqvarna, Monte Carlo. Number 83. Back in fifth. It's the 29. Here comes Whitcomb. He's found his way to fifth spot, Ken. And he'll be looking to get himself within that one spot as he falls here. Mark Lamberton making a great run here. Here's Whitcomb, as you point out, around Lamberton, around Billy Holbrook. And Whitcomb realizes he's got to go and go hard. He has got 25 laps left when they come by this time to see what he can do about John Paul, Gene Paul Sear. So easy to think of Gene Paul as John Paul Cabana. He's sure driving like him today. 
Whitcomb up on the outside going for Stacy Cahoon. The battle is in second spot at the moment. Craddock. Craddock is, this is his finest hour as far as racing's concerned. He's being so respectful of those guys around him, but he is giving it everything he's got. Question is, has he got enough to go the distance here? Young Bruno in that Kenny drug car pulls up beside him. And Stacy Cahoon, the Husqvarna car. And right with him comes the Pete's RV, number 25, Whitcomb is there. They stack them up for second place. This is all for second. Boy, look at that tussle in the back straightaway, Ryan. And here comes Whitcomb. Up on the outside now, he's beginning to roll. And so is Brian Hoare, as he's gone to that outside line, and he's doing it early enough that if it works like it did at the end of the segment too, again, he will make some positions up. Gene Paul Sear continues to gather up about a 12-car length lead. Craddock stays second, and Bruno just cannot get around Craddock, who fights him so hard into the corners. He's just about rolling the tires right off the wheels as he tries to hold that position and still give the line, the racing line on the outside, to Bruno. And everyone's bottled up right there in this war for second spot. Just behind Craddock in the 65 and Bruno. It's Stacy Cahoon in the 83 and Whitcomb. And my, isn't Whitcomb being patient just sitting there directly behind them, Burger Blake. Berger Blake has got this number 27 sorted out. Did not qualify the first day. Did not qualify second round. Had to come into the consolation race. But now the car is working as well as Berger Blake works. Greg Blake in the white and green. Merchants Bank, number 27. Up the outside. Down the back straight away. Bruno has taken over in second spot. And he goes on a scalping party for Gene Paul Sear. Craddock now stays in third. Here comes Whitcomb on the outside. Down this back straightaway, right there was where Whitcomb at over 80, 85 miles an hour lost it one night, head onto the wall, 25 feet in the air, end over end, out into the parking lot. He was back one week later. Whitcomb stays right there, but here comes the pride of Caledonia County. Stacy Cahoon, number 83 on the inside, and it is Cahoon giving the shoulder to Whitcomb. Whitcomb took it and gave it right back. Hard racing at the nation's site of excitement, Thunder Road. Whitcomb's car is going away, Ken. He, uh, he was running right up on the side of Craddock in the 65, and now he's lost the position to Stacy Cahoon. He's also holding up Berger Blake in the Brian Horrid 45. Um, it certainly looks as of right now that you're going to your no ball winner is going to be Gene Paul here if he can hold on to that first place spot he has. Inside opens up and look who's thrashing through from the absolute 24th position with a new engine in his car, Phil Scott, and this is just for personal glory. He's out of the points. He's just running this race out just to prove he was in the milk bowl. What a show he's putting on. He goes up, Scott going around from 24th position. Phil Scott around Billy Holbrook. They've opened up the inside on Cahoon. For a report on what happened to the 54, let's go to the pits, get the story. Here's Big Bigelow. Chuck Beatty shot at the milk bowl, just went down the tubes, ladies and gentlemen. He had a shot going into this, only one point behind the leader. But as you can see, he's in the pits with the front end all towed up. He may have a flat tire. Chuck Beatty, the pulse that his hopes for the milk bowl championship is over. Getting down towards the finish. Two to go. There's your leader, number 32. Gene Paul Sear, Milton, Vermont, is on his way. White flag, final lap. Bruno moving, but he's seven car lengths back. Whitka making one final stab to come through. And right behind him comes Brian Hoare. The checkers are out, and Gene Paul Sear is going to win. Sear is going to win. Bruno is in second. Eric Williams fights his way to the line. Eric Williams with a great last lap move for a couple of positions. But Gene Paul Sear has done it. The number 32. Milton, Vermont. The Sear Lumber Bruce King Automotive. Chevrolet Monte Carlo. 
carries the colors in this segment, and I believe that's going to be your overall winner in points, Ron. I'm certain of that, Ken. I believe that you'll find that Gene Paul Sear is your number one uh, segment winner in here third in the third segment, and the overall winner also. I think your second place uh, will go to Dave Whitcomb overall. In third place, you'll find the uh, 45 of Brian Hoare on a last lap pass out of turn four, overtaking Billy Holbrook to finish third overall. That's how I got it unofficially. We'll see what the scores. Well, we'll see what the scores say as the 32 comes in. It is a moment and then some for Norm Sear, the father of this young man who has driven into victory lane at the site of excitement in America's toughest short track race. Gary, just between you and me, you find Earnhardt, you know, intimidating? Well, he's pretty darn competitive. Nobody trades paint like Dale. He does have that black Monte Carlo. Yeah, he's got that black Monte Carlo. But remember one thing, when he first started, his car was pink. No, pink? Pink? Pink, and he's never gotten over it. Genuine Chevrolet, the cars more champions trust, no matter what color they're painted. Okay, we're in victory lane with the 33rd annual Milk Bowl champion, Gene Paul Sear. Had a real good segment out there. How'd the car go that third segment? Yeah, the car went on a rail. I mean, we started off and just got on the high groove and just went. And didn't have a problem at all with the car. Now, uh, you look obviously quite hot. Is it as uh, grueling grace out there as it seemed? Or did the brakes after the 50 lappers give you a little time to regroup? Or was it uh, a pretty hard-fought battle out there? Well, you know, we never really cooled off much after the first segment. It was so hot uh, in the car, the first segment. Second uh, segment, the temperature was about the same. The third segment was a little bit cooler. <laughs> You know, I'd like to I'd like to thank my sponsors also and uh, the sponsors of the race, uh, Vermont Chevy dealers. You know, I'm really proud that I was able to win with a Chevy for for them, and also like to thank BU Pub and Sear Lumber. Okay, that's Gene Paul Sear down here in Picture Lane of the 33rd Annual Milk Bowl. Back to you, Ken. Final standings in fifth place today, Billy Holbrook with a total of 27 points after the three 50 lap segments. Brian Hoare with that Dodge Avenger came back to get fourth place overall with a brilliant move on the very last lap to make the difference and give him that slot. Finishing in third overall, Dave Whitcomb, who was the man to beat all day in the Milk Bowl. Dave Whitcomb winds up in third, and it was Greg Blake of Barry Vermont second. He comes home with a total of 20 points, and then Gene Paul Sear is your winner, and he stands top the podium and gets ready to kiss the cow. <laughs> Can't do better than that when you come to the Milk Bowl, Ron Barkham. Well, you've got to give Gene Paul Sear a whole lot of credit, Ken. Uh, he went out and did just exactly what he had to do the last race. He won it. He came home the overall winner. I think you have to absolutely have to give the Burger Plate crew and the Burger himself a whole lot of credit. Coming out of the B feature to finish second overall is almost unheard of at the Milk Bowl. But that shows you, again, just how competitive these cars are this year, Ken, and how competitive the drivers are that drive these cars. I mean, to come out of a B feature and still be able to finish second is a tremendous effort on both the crew and the driver. So and it's over for 1996 for Ron Barkham and Big Bigelow. I'm Ken Squire. Thank you for in being with us to enjoy the 33rd annual Vermont Chevy Dealers Milk Bowl. And the champion for 1996 is a driver of a Chevrolet Monte Carlo from Milton, Vermont, Gene Paul Sear with a genuine Vermont beauty, celebrates in victory lane at the site of excitement to a standing ovation.